Hello again and welcome. Michael Pozzola here. I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Value Capping Rant. And on this rant, we're going to be looking at the 2022 bluegrass stakes at Keeneland, the Wood Memorial at Aqueduct, and the Santa Anita Derby at, you guessed it, Santa Anita. Um, I think that very often with these races for three-year-old colts, including the Kentucky Derby, there are often uh, more questions than answers. And in these three Kentucky Derby prep races, um, it's, it's no exception. So um, we'll take a look at those races in some detail, although I'll try to make it quick. I know I've heard from some of you who said, Michael, come on, let's get to it. But I'm still going to let you know, for those of you who don't know me, uh, who I am and what I do. Okay, my name is Michael Pizzola. And I've been teaching and writing about this great game for over 30 years. I'm the author of the best-selling uh, handicapping book, uh, Handicapping Magic. I am co-author of the classic Pace Makes the Race. I'm the creator of the original online racing form, which in its current iteration is called Post Time Daily, and you can find it at posttimedaily.com. I'm also the creator of the Value Capper software. That's the software that you're going to see me use uh, in this video. It's a... It's a product of uh, decades of work and refinement. If you want to know more about it, I've done a free four-part video course uh, on value capping and its principles at valuecapper.com. You get a video every couple of days. And listen, I don't, you know, if you're not interested in software, that's absolutely fine. Skip the fourth video. The first a uh, couple of videos talk about the principles of value capping. And that's what I want to demonstrate in this video. Because what I do is I, I do my best to help horse players and handicappers and trainers and owners and tournament champions succeed in the modern game because the game is different. You know if you play. And I do that by, by helping them overcome uh, overwhelm and confusion and adopting a value-oriented approach so that they can increase their ROI by focusing on value, making a value bet rather than trying to predict the races, which ultimately is impossible with 100% certainty. We get rid of a lot of frustration about the game and we develop a how do I call it? Stress-free investment strategy. If you've been to a race book or, or a racetrack uh, anytime, <laughs> anytime, you'll notice that uh, the majority of our colleagues, uh, horse-playing colleagues, are not exactly stress-free, certainly not when the race is going on. Um, a few points about the video and then we'll get right into the races. First of all, this is not a touting video. Not interested in picking horses. Um, certainly, you know, there are hundreds of them. Just look on either side of this page. You'll find them. People, well, oh, you know, I'm liking this horse because of this. No, I want to show you what I do, how I handle um, uh, admittedly rather difficult races using the principles of value capping. Now, look, I'm not interested in making a pick in every race. Don't care. It's an opportunity. You know, the to me, the Kentucky Derby is, you know, race 12 at Churchill Downs on May, whatever, uh, of the, May 7th of this year. And it's just, I'm looking for value opportunities. So if I don't see potential value in a race, based on my lights, based on how I look at a race, I'll tell you that. So... For those of you who are unfamiliar with the value capping framework, what I try to do and what I advise is to bet horses you like that the public should not like. In other words, you found something in them. Preferably, that horse is running against flawed favorites. Importantly, you must wait for your price and then let the bet make you, in other words, have developed a felt sense by practicing that, you know, things feel right and you're going to make the bet. Um, now, again, with Value Capper, I, as you'll see, it makes pace projections the most sophisticated pace ratings and numbers that I know of, and yet it uses them in a contrarian way. It looks at form cycles, makes an odds line, and so forth. Having said that, 
as spiffy as that, as that software is, software, methods, numbers, all of that are indicators, pointers. They are not crystal balls, right? Because otherwise they wouldn't have to run the race. So just look at the numbers and, oh, the six horse wins. Okay, next. You know, I'm making this on Thursday. Um, I have, don't have scratches. I don't have changes. There's supposed to be some bad uh, or rainy weather uh, at uh, Keeneland in Lexington, Lexington Kentucky um, on Saturday. Maybe, maybe not. I am uh, looking at these races uh, for a fast track. At the Bluegrass, I'll take a look at uh, possible differences that it would make uh, if the track comes up, uh, comes up wet. Um, okay, with that all said, come and look over my shoulder and I'll um, demonstrate the principles of value capping by looking at these races and using the value capper software. So the first race we're going to look at is the 2022 Grade 1 Bluegrass Stakes at Keeneland. And here is what I look at right out of the box uh, with, um, with value capper. It's the ninth race at Keeneland. It's a mile and an eighth. I've got one, two, three, four, five horses above random. Um, and let's look a little more closely. The first thing that I notice about a race, not who's got the numbers, who's got the speed, who's got the... None of that. I look to see whether my, meaning value capper's, opinion about the race corresponds with how the public should look at it. Now, there are two pointers to how the public should look at a race. Um, there is a concept that I developed many years ago called the contention line. And the contention line attempts to, to see what the public would do based on just the information and very, very fundamental information or simple information uh, in the past performances, things like um, speed rating and um, claiming price and very, very rudimentary. And of course, there's the morning line, which is not done by a computer. It's done by a living, breathing human being who has his or her own opinions and therefore can be variable. The contention line isn't. So in this race, if you notice, the top three contention lines in the race, the horses the public should like, and the top three morning lines in the race are the same three colts, Emmanuel, Smile Happy, and Zandon. When we look at how the race projects, and you see up there in that square, it says neutral and highly pressured. So positionally, it, not much of anything, but when you add the numbers in, it comes up that it may it may it may shape up to have a lot of pressure up front, which means that horses that expend their energy late may have an advantage. In this case, we see no one's surprise, Emmanuel and Volcanic, who is the fulcrum in the race. If you, I did a video on fulcrum. Just search YouTube for Michael Pozzola fulcrum. You'll find it. Um, in other words, they should be prominent. Uh, in, in and around the second call. And we find those two colts, you know, pretty much there. Um, but there are many of them at the second call who might be vying for it, which is why when you add in the late velocity, this race may come up as highly pressured. Now, there's the other part to that equation, which is what does the track do with that? And here is a, a track profile going back several years, um, looking at the stakes races run at Keeneland at nine furlongs, at eight, a mile and an eighth. And if you notice the beaten lengths at the second call for the last four, 0 0.5, 0 1.50, you look all the way down the list, they're pretty close up. It's the same thing at the second call with the exception of one race run in 2018. Um, last year, the Bluegrass winner was half a length off at both calls. The year before, a uh, length and a half to a length off. The year before that, nose and nose for the lead, and so forth. So positionally, it looks early, and yet the energy 
favors a horse that can um, turn it on late. So this is no surprise. That's, a ch that's the way a champion racehorse expends uh, his or her energy. So a colt that can be not too far back and yet have enough left for the end, is that's a champion's profile. And it's no surprise that we see it here. Now, as I said, um, rainy weather is forecast, but you know, <laughs> I don't like to rely on that, but I did take a look to see what happens if Keeneland comes up sloppy on Saturday, and there's not much difference. Uh, I've got four examples since 2017 of stakes races run in the slop at Keeneland at a mile and an eighth, uh, on or near the lead at the first and second calls, and latish energy, um, the way it expends energy. And since I'll be mentioning that, let me just really quickly, it sounds, oh my God, percentage energy. Look, horses are herd animals. I've heard. Sorry, that was a terrible pun. But I, what I mean I heard is, you know, I grew up in New York City. I, the only horses I really saw were the ones pulling the carts in Central Park and, and such. Um, so when you watch these National Geographic uh, documentaries and herd of zebra trying to get away from the lions, there are a couple of zebras that go way out to the front because they want to be as far away from the lions as possible. Uh, there's the um, company, what does they say, Misery Loves Company, or there's safety in numbers, the ones who are mid-pack. Yeah, it's just, I'll hang out with Joey over here. So, Joey, you watch my back, I'll watch yours. And then there are the... Um, yeah, I'm not going to run. He comes after me, then I'll run. So the ones that are towards the, the back of the pack, and then we'll expend their energy late if necessary, okay? So a colt's running style, a horse's running style, I should say, is, you know, can be, once they have established themselves, can be fairly consistent. And there's the rub. Many of these colts we're look, we'll be looking at in this video they haven't established themselves. They've had two or three lifetime races. But what, we, what we're looking for uh, in the bluegrass, the big insight, right, is a champion's um, expenditure. Up kind of close, uh, expends late. So with that, let's look at the top, um, the top colt in the line, and that's Emmanuel. And it's on the top with a gap, and you might say, woohoo, let's go. It's Todd Pletcher, nine to two morning line. That's, you know, that's nice. And it is, although we have to look a little more closely. The target in this race is rattle and roll at 157.6 on my numbers. Emmanuel ran a 163.3 in an allowance race at, at Tampa back in January. Now, right after doing that, he finished fourth, beaten by five lengths in the Fountain of Youth. So much of the good things, uh, along with the good things the value capper sees in Emmanuel, it looks at that 163 and says, wow, that's pretty big in this field. But if we look at the fountain of youth, okay, this is the 2022 fountain of youth, which was run back in March. Emmanuel once again came on top with a gap and it was based on that same allowance race at Tampa Bay. Now, maybe the number was too high. Maybe the horse just had it, or the colt just had it in him that one time, and maybe the horse bounced in the fountain of youth, and maybe, and maybe, and maybe. We just don't know. All I know is, based on that number at Tampa Bay, I value capper, made Emmanuel look very strong. Emmanuel finished fourth by five lines, so he did not run to that number, and there's always the, the issue. Right now, Emmanuel has had three lifetime races. Did it get ready by winning its maiden, then run this big race, and then regressed? Or is it that that number is out of whack? And I'm look, as I said, no numbers are perfect. The, one of the very first handicapping expos uh, here in Vegas. I want to say 1990. I want to say at the uh, at the Mirage. Uh, I was standing 
almost between uh, Len Rogozin and Andy Beyer. Andy Beyer, who I knew a little bit, got to know uh, better as we released the um, the on first online uh, racing forum with uh, in partnership with the Daily Racing Forum. And uh, in any event, they had a difference of opinion. Uh, Andy was saying, and it's my opinion, uh, you know, my opinion is closer to Andy's than it is to the absolutism of at that time of Len Rogozin, who was critical of Andy Byer, who Andy Byer said, look, if I make a number and the horse consistently doesn't run to the number or horses from that race consistently don't, I will adjust that number. To which, um, to, to which Lenny said something, you know, in his typical style, I said, well, then you don't know what the heck you're talking about. Uh, so I don't know. I, and I honestly, you know, have to live, if we play this game at all, we have to live in I don't know a lot of the time. Is that number um, just out of whack? Is it a bad number? Is it a one-time thing for the horse? Was there a bounce? So given Emmanuel's performance in the Fountain of Youth, this, this is the first question I have about this race. Should that Tampa Bay number be relied upon? And it was an allowance race and you know, Manuel kind of got loose at the end. Don't really know. I'm, I'm a little ouchy because in the Fountain of Youth, it looked, you know, pretty strong. And it was based, I won't say entirely, but in large part on that number. So we're back to looking at the three morning line favorites on top. And one of those is Smile Happy, who by all rights should be the favorite in this race. Um... He's been on a layoff since February. No big deal. He won at first asking. Uh, he ran a good race in the Risen Star. Um, the numbers were fine in his two-year-old season. Won his maiden at first asking. Earned a 156. Today we're looking for a 157 at least. Uh, ran a 158 in winning the Kentucky Jockey Club. Uh, $400,000 grade two. Um, it... Don't know, don't know what the numbers were like in the Risen Star, but I've, I've got a slow number uh, for that race. Now, maybe it was because, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know why. I don't think it regressed. It ran a very nice race in that. This is a latish looking colt, which is great for the race projection, which projects a lot of pressure up front favoring a closing horse, not a great tri uh, fit to the track profile because it's a little further back in its first and third race and its, its win um, at Keeneland, where it was fifth by third. That's kind of far back. Um, at the Kentucky Jockey Club, it was fourth by a half at the second call. Not too bad. In the Risen Star, seventh by four and a half lengths. And if you notice this percentage um, early, percentage energy, it's on the late side. So, brings up the second question in the race. Which will be the most dominant factor? The highly pressured nature of the race projection or the track profile for mile and an eighth races run in good company at Keeneland? Now, like most of the... I don't mean to be critical, but most of the tone of people you'll hear talking about Issues like this and races like this will be something like, well, I just think that given um, given the way the speed looks like it has to develop and it has to be, and then this horse, if it gets the trip, will come off the pace. There's this, there is this, I don't know how to put it, racing fans, this tone of certainty, which when, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men off go awry... And they go awry, it was like, well, he didn't get the trip. Well, the speed didn't develop. Well, yo, that's exactly the point. We don't know in advance. So uh, that's why you won't hear me say things with certainty unless I'm certain of something. Like, I'll tell you, I'm certain there's going to be a horse I'm going to bet. Maybe not in this race, you know, but when there is, <laughs> when there's a bet, I'll tell you that. I'll say, yeah, I know there are these things that I don't know, and that's why I require such and such a price. You see that difference between predictive? Well, you know, 
Fletcher put the blinkers on, and he rarely does that. Oh, whatever. I don't even know if that's right. I am, I, because little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But there's that idea that I can predict if I put all these together in the right way. And I look at it differently. Most people have very good numbers, or if not the excellent toppity, tippity top numbers, they've got numbers that are readily available that are pretty darn good. And so if you notice, the game has become a little bit tougher. The public is often on the quote-unquote right horses, the fast horses, the informed horses, the um, place at the proper level horses. So rather than try to predict... Value capping says, well, let's see if we can find something that the public may overlook, that they shouldn't like, and go from there. Okay, sorry about the sermon. Here we go. Still those three morning line <laughs> favorites and contentions are staring at us in the race. The third one down is Zandon, um, again, uh, off since February from the Risen Star. It has run one number above the target that was in his maiden race, where he ran a 158.7. And then in all three of his races, he closed. Now there again, uh, in the Remsen, which he darn near won, uh, he came from a little bit closer, but still made a, made a close. And, you know, he was kind of far back in the Risen Star, in eighth position by five lengths. And somewhere in the middle in his maiden race. So we got a mixed running style. I'm not so sure about the numbers. Either I'm way off in the numbers I made uh, for the fairgrounds race and the aqueduct race, the Risen Star and the Remsen, or maybe, maybe this horse isn't as strong as it looks. But again, who knows? These are lightly raced three-year-old colts. Can they improve greatly? Of course, you've seen that year after year. Um, rattle and roll. Uh, now, there's no question about uh, this horse's um, running style. This is a deep closer. It's the target in the race, meaning uh, his last race number is the best of the other horse's last race numbers, which are confirmed. Um, no problem running it. Uh, this is a grade one winner. He won a, the Breeders' Futurity uh, back in last October. Grade one race, $500,000 race. It's the same question as with Smile Happy, who happens to be a stable mate being um, trained by Mr. McPeak. Um, so the, the, the question is, will the pressure be so intense because of the, you know, the, way the, the way it's drawn up on the chalkboard, will that be so intense that it will favor these closers? Or will the pressure not develop so much because because, you know, jockeys can read the form as well, and one of those early horses are able to take advantage of the track profile favoring horses closer to the lead? No, no, it's the same question we had with Smile Happy in this race. So what do you, what do, you do with all of that? You just close your eyes and go, this one, I like Smile Happy, it makes me feel happy. Uh, I like uh, whatever. Given these questions, which I don't have a definite answer, and, and I don't, know, you know, we can guess, we can speculate, but here's the main thing. The top three contention and mourning lines are at the top of my line. The public should have the quote-unquote right horses in this race. Now, is there a possibility of some upset? We can look back and we could say, yeah, maybe rattle and roll. I mean, if you're looking for a bomb, ethereal road, um, rattle and roll, you know, at 15 or 20 to 1, perhaps, ethereal road, nosebleed area, even higher than that. But honestly, I don't see a, a, a real strong reason to bet against any of these. You might say some of them are a little late and like that. So as strictly a secondary bet, I might take... As a nod to the fact that I'm a racing fan and I like to have a couple of recreational bets on these big days, might take a few bucks on rattle and roll, but without enthusiasm, this, for me, 
my assessment based on both the questions I have about the race and the fact that the top three morning lines, top three contention lines are uh, value cappers uh, assessed best horses, it's an easy pass bet for me. Oh, there it is again, staring me in the face. Top three morning lines. Okay, the next race is the 2022 Grade 2 Wood Memorial at Aqueduct. Always one of my favorite races, uh, just because I used to see them all the time when I was a, when I was a kid. So, it's a mile and an eighth. Here again, we have a conflict between the positional aspect of the race, which shows the race may be a bit pressured, and when you add velocity in, that it might be unpressured. On top of that, we see two of the Colts have inflated odds. In other words, I have given, and value capper has given them uh, not a great shot in the race, and yet the contention isn't bad, and the morning line, they are co-second morning line favorites. And specifically, we're talking about Mo Donegal and early voting. But before we get to those, let's look at the Colts at the top of the line, Berese, Morello, and AP Secret. Um, okay, how do, and, and we're going to look at it through the lens of how does the race project and what does the track, um, quote unquote, require. Here's a look at the mile and an eight stakes race that we're running an aqueduct for the, I'm going back to 2019 here, but let's just look 2020 on. And if you look at the beaten lengths, they're all pretty close at the second call with one exception. And the energy, the percentage energy is late. Anytime you get in the 50s and, gosh, 49s is late. Although the Basanda that was run back in January went, someone wired the field. Uh, I, I forget the, I forget, I forget the horse's name. But it went in 52, and the race right before that went in 51.8, call it 52. There was one exception for coming off the pace, and that happened to be last year's Wood Memorial, which was won um, by a colt that paid $146, came from 10th. Ten lanes back, ninth at the first and second calls, dead last, and ran away with it. Now, here's a look back at last year's Wood Memorial. And those of you who will pause the video and say, Hey, look at that. Burbonic won the race and paid $146, and this Jamoke had him sixth on the line. What the heck are you doing? Well, it's not the point I'm making. <laughs> the, point, the point I'm making, this is... this came up, if you look at the top, as a pressured, highly pressured race. Yeah? Um, the four, uh, no, four of the five Colts on top of it, Crowder Trade had a very hard race, a couple of layoffs on risk-taking, Brooklyn Strong and, and Weyburn, leaving Burbonic, who had, tote odds was way above the value capper price, or, or target odds, if you will. As a recreational bet, a couple of bucks on it, yeah, it was very nice. As a really solid bet, mm, no. But notice it's possible to close in the wood, as this colt showed last year, came from ninth. And Crowded Trade, who was close to being one of the favorites in the race, uh, he closed as well to get third, Dynamic won. Um, horse with decent late fractions. So in other words, is is this what will happen? Um, I don't know. I do know the race projects to be highly uh, or pressured um, on the positional side, but unpressured on the velocity side. So, okay, uh, I don't know where I'm going to go. Almost all the races are kind of near the lead, almost all the winners at a mile and an eighth at Aqueduct are kind of near the lead. They have a, a, a bit of a late expenditure. Uh, however, uh, when I add uh, velocity to the position, I get unpressured. Um, value capper bias the race early, and that's the screen I've been showing you. What happens if we look late 
and we change the bias to late. Oh, guess what? We still have Barese, Morello, AP, Secret, and now Modonigal moves into the, um, into the top cluster of Colts. Um, time to take a closer look. Barese has done nothing wrong in his career. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't care how other people pronounce this Colts name. Baris. You remember Mikey Baris? Yes, cousin Jimmy. Jimmy went away for a while. You know, he went upstate to college. You remember? Yeah, you remember those? Yeah, the Baris brothers. You remember them. Yeah. So that's kind of an Americanization of this beautiful word, Barese, someone who comes from uh, near Bari in the Apulia uh, region of Italy, where I have some ancestors who come from. So it's Barese. I don't care what they say. It's Barese. Anyway, Barese has done virtually nothing wrong, uh, won all three of, of his races at Aqueduct. He won at six and a half. He won at a mile. Uh, he's the target in the race, top last race number at 155.6. That's been confirmed. What's the problem? Well, he's a New York State bred. Oh, horrors. They never win the big races. Hello, funny side? Funny side reversing against Empire Maker, if you remember back in 2003. In fact, Empire Maker beat Funny Side in the Wood Memorial, as I recall. I'll have to fact check myself. Um, and then they reversed in the Kentucky Derby. But Funny Side was a was a New York State bred, so it's not that they can't win these big races. And you know we've got Michael Maker and Davis has ridden them in his last two blowout wins. The running style. Looks right. He's closed from a couple of lengths back or a length back, made a little move. The uh, uh, percentage energy looks in range. So nothing wrong with this Colt, but I say, uh, other than its class. Here's the 800 pound gorilla, according to the public in the race. This is Morello. Also, three for three lifetime. All three of those races were at Aqueduct. Right? Should give him an advantage. Just blew out the field in the Gotham at even money. Uh, won his maiden at first asking. Won a stakes race at Aqueduct at seven furlongs on and off track. Um, the numbers are fine. Looking for a 155.6 at least. And he's got a 155 on top and a 154.8 and 158 second back. Yeah. Nothing wrong with this cult at all. How about AP Secret? Uh, I've got a few other issues with this. Again, looking at the target of 155.6, I'm very uh, say. <laughs> it's got one race. That was at an allowance race at Gulfstream. Showed a little early speed in the Fountain of Youth last, but it's only got one match against the target. Not very consistent. And then there's the fact that he won his maiden, um, took him a couple of times to win non-winners one allowance, didn't do so well in the Fountain of Youth. Now we can say that's because he was off for a couple of months uh, or that the, the win in the allowance race, that number was too big, if you will, and the public dismissed him in the Fountain of Youth. And you could say, well, they rightly dismissed him. He finished seventh, uh, and all he had done was win a, a maiden and a non-winner's one. Um, so this is not the strongest looking horse. Then again, it does have that big number at Gulfstream. Let's look at the Colts that when we first had the race set up as early, were not very well regarded by Value Capra's line. And the first is Mo Donegal, who's the fulcrum in the race. Uh, he has won at nine furlongs at Aqueduct in the Remsen uh, back, in, uh, back in December when he was a two-year-old, a grade two race. It's two for four lifetime. Um, the number on that race was not very good. 
In fact, if you look at all four of his numbers, he's only got one that is at or near the target. So what do you do? This is not really strong. This could be an improving, uh, an improving Colt, uh, pretty impressive uh, two-year-old campaign. How will it react to the layoff? We know we can win at a mile and an eighth at Aqueduct. And that's one of the reasons, uh, other than, you know, Rosario Pletcher, that Modonigal will most certainly be bet. Nothing wrong. It improves. If it runs back to that 156 or improves, it's, you know, the running style is fine, by the way. A little bit of a close. Now, if the race um, goes, goes to how it projects, which is going to be a little unpressured, um, Modonigal may be in a little hot water. And what do you say about early voting? So this cult is two for two lifetime. Both of those wins were at Aqueduct, and one of them was in the Withers back in February. Nice grade three, and he wired the field at a mile and an eighth. So we have both Modonigal and early voting. Now, numbers, not so great against the target. Of course, the public will say Chad Brown and Ortiz and two for two, and they see that, and it's never been not the favorite in its race and blew out a couple of fields and will undoubtedly try to be a part of the, will try to, don't know if it'll get there, try to be part of the early pace. Can't really throw stones at other than its numbers don't look great on, by my lights, my numbers. Okay. So what to do? Well, pretty easy. I think the public will be betting, oh, big surprise, Morello, Mo Donegal, and early voting. I think the morning line maker has it exactly right, and rightly so. Collectively, they've, these cults have run nine races in their lives. They've won seven of them. Is there a value approach? Well, I think the favorites are strong. Uh, Morello on all counts. Mo Donegal and uh, early voting... Yeah, okay, except for the numbers. So therefore, my assessment is they're not unbeatable, the favorites in this race. They're not exactly flawed, by the way. They're just not unbeatable. So at 7 to 1 and up, I would take a bet on the 8, Barese. As far as a secondary bet or to use with small exotics, and I'm not very confident or enthusiastic about uh, AP's secret. Um, I don't think it's as strong, but tempt me with the 25, 30 to one shots, certainly going to be in exotics. Um, I'm, why I'm doing that is I'm kind of overlooking the class uh, issues in the race. I know Barese is a New York state bred. I know that AP's secret is only one, uh, his maiden and a non-winner's one at Gulfstream. But Certainly in the case of Barese, the numbers are just fine. Uh, if he runs to one of those numbers, he could pull an upset. I will need, again, 7-1. I think, it's, I think Barese will be the fourth favorite, fourth favorite in the race. I think they'll overlook AP Secret, probably rightly so. But again, at a high enough price, I'll say that that big number that he ran was legit. <laughs> at 8 or 9-1, to one, I'll say, nah. It's out of whack. This must be my legal training. <laughs> if you're paying me, I'll take the position. <laughs> if you're not paying me, I won't take the position. <laughs> so, you know, I was never that kind of lawyer. But, all right, enough. Now, this is preliminary on the Grade One Santa Anita Derby, 2022. Because in order to get this video out, I have to, you know, I have a deadline. And as we speak, the final file from the data providers and the track uh, is not available. I've got a preliminary file. Fear not, this is an easy one. The top three cults are Messier, Forbidden Kingdom. <gasps> Michael, you're shocking us. Really? Yeah. And <laughs> Taiba, okay? They are the top three uh, contentions 
uh, in the race. They are the top three on the value capper line. I would be shocked if they are not both the top three morning line favorites. I think they'll go for, I don't know, Messier probably. Forbidden Kingdom will be close. They'll, they'll be the kind of things where they'll be seven to five, eight to five kind of thing. Tabia maybe five to two. Three. I think that's going to be the bulk of the um, of the betting. So what do you do in a race like this? It it projects to be an unpressured race. Forbidden Kingdom should have his own way on the front end. These are all, these are good decent racehorses. Here's the problem. The top three again, and they're gonna. I think they're gonna take a huge part of the pool, and I'm for one am not interested in taking a race apart for an hour to come up with a two to one shot. It's just not worth the risk of racing in all the unknowns. So, for me, the public will bet the obvious strong Colts, Messier, uh, Forbidden Kingdom, maybe Taiba a little bit. If I had someone put a gun to my head, I'd say, well, you know, it's unpressured. Might have might have it all its own way, forbidden kingdom, but it's not gonna be at a price I would I would take uh, for a bet. So they'll bet them. They're, they don't have a whole lot of flaws. Value capper has the public's probable top three Colts on top. This is an easy pass. The odds won't be there to have a value bet. And that's what I told you at the beginning of this video. And I'll tell you every time, if there's no value, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in being an expert. People go, oh, Michael, you're an expert. You read all these articles and all these, you know, these books and lectures and seminars. And yes, so I'm interested in, well, of course, I'm a racing fan and I love these big races. But the reason that I get up to the window and bet is to... There are children and elderly people in the room right now. They may not want to listen to this, but the reason that I bet is to make money, okay? That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in being right about the race. And, oh, look, he thinks Forbidden Kingdom was better than Messier, and I thought Messier was better. And, hey, you know what? Forbidden Kingdom was better. So what? There's no, there's no money there. There's no, there's no price that will offset the risk. Easy. Pass. But if you're in the predictive mode, or if you if you play this game as a recreational escape from the sometimes not too good news that you see on <laughs> television, right? Uh, or just about anywhere you look, or social media, uh, you know, this is a wonderful escape. I get it. Hey, you know, I had the winner of the Santa Anita Derby. He paid five sixty, but I just knew he was going to be wonderful. Been there and done that, really. But I've taken, for the last decade and more, to really honing in on whether there will be a value bet or not. And in these videos, if I don't see a value bet, I'll tell you that. If I see a value bet, I'll tell you that too. And... You know, maybe others aren't uncomfortable doing this. I'll tell you the horses I'm going to bet and the minimum odds I would take based on the same kind of analysis that led me to pass these other races. Anyway, enough talking, Michael. I hope you enjoyed that. I thank you so much for spending this time with me. For those of you who are using Value Capper, I hope that was helpful. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't need any one tool, okay? I happen to think this is spiffy. I use it every day, okay? But if you don't use my software or any software, I hope you will see how um, starting with the idea of finding a good value bet in the race can frame or put into perspective the questions and unknowns that must necessarily come up with every race. Thank you. Thanks for spending this time. Thank you for uh, your support and your kind words. And you know what? Derby will be here before we know it. Until then, be well, take care, let the bet make you, and I'll see you soon.